Welcome to this week's edition of the Sustainability Dialogues in Saudi Arabia, a podcast series focused mainly on helping supporting the ideas of driving the kingdom towards its net zero targets of carbon emissions and its uh, reforms into the becoming a much more sustainable and green economy. Uh, and now in a, in a year in which COP27 and COP28 are both coming to the region, it's an exciting time for everybody and in, uh, indeed in some ways not a choice ultimately for all of us as individuals and collectives to be building our own roadmaps towards a more sustainable future. Today, we're looking at the subject of smart and sustainable cities, particularly as the headline of our session is governance and policies to develop smart cities and sustainable cities in Saudi Arabia. I'm delighted to start off this afternoon with our, one of our guest speakers, Yvonne Lynch, who indeed has spent the last four years in Saudi Arabia. Yvonne is, is the urban greening and climate resilience strategist at the Royal Commission for Riyadh City and <clears throat> is very much involved in a leadership role in what is generally being regarded as Green Riyadh, probably the largest integrated urban greening project on the planet, which is saying something these days. Yvonne, tell us a little bit about the ambition, because so much of Saudi is about nearly greenfield, literally new cities, new projects. Your challenge is to green this ginormous existing city called Riyadh. That's right. Uh, in, in some ways, I, I also describe it as, you know, one of the world's uh, largest urban retrofitting programs. And I think when you look at the work that the Royal Commission are undertaking in Riyadh right now, certainly that's what's happening between Green Riyadh and the Riyadh Metro and various other projects, including the Dereya Gate. So what you're seeing is, I guess, uh, an unprecedented level of transformation for a city that has rapidly evolved in, in quite a short period of time. So if we look back at Riyadh, you know, in the 19, well, um, the, the 1950s, the population was, you know, very, very, very small population um, of around 50,000 people. You look now and we're up at 7 million. So it's it's basically uh, a city that's on this uh, trajectory that is uh, hard to keep pace with. And, and, and where, now, where is the destination? Is there a plateau in sight on that population size? There, well, there, there are, I don't think there's a plateau. Um, they're planning for Riyadh at uh, 15 million right now. And look, I mean, most cities around the world are uh, growing, um, but uh, Riyadh is trying to do things a little bit differently. I guess it's uh, it's taken uh, up the trend of greening with the Green Riyadh program, but it's doing it a little bit differently to the other cities. So part of what it's doing there is looking at planting millions of trees and creating thousands of new parks to create new recreational spaces within the city. And uh, by doing that, I mean, they're, they're really creating parks at a level um, that you, we just haven't seen in a city before. You know, it's one thing to say we're going to plant um, trees, but it's another thing entirely to create parks and a sustainable water network uh, to go alongside that. So uh, the city is reforming its uh, its identity. And in some ways, it's, it's harking back a little bit to the past because uh, Riyadh, the word itself means green oasis. And definitely with a program like Riyadh, uh, Green Riyadh, it's trying to return to that identity, its core identity in a world that, you know, has uh, so many rapid uh, challenges and transformations going on, like urbanization, the digital transformation, climate change. It's trying to solve many of its problems with some very um, smart and integrated programs. Well, let's welcome our other speaker this afternoon, Rushi Rama, lead of the G20 Global Smart Cities Alliance World Economic Forum. We had today, Rushi, the uh, release of the 
what is regarded as the happiness, the, the global happiness, world happiness report of the cities most, uh, you know, most enjoyed to live in. None of them are, unfortunately, in this neighborhood at the moment. Most of them, strangely, in northern dark Europe, which, of course, is, uh, is, is, is a, in some ways, from our perspective, where we live in a lot of light, somewhat unusual. But your thoughts on that idea, the, the, where that intersection, sustainable city and happiness, uh, where is the pathway forward to be able to migrate up that list? You know, that's that's such a, a complex equation, if I can put it that way. Um, the the fact is that there's been many attempts by, uh, up to this point to come up with frameworks, indicator frameworks and and strategies that would get you higher up that that ranking, as it were, you know, it, whether we're talking about happiness or quality of life or livability. And, uh, you know, as I said, it's it's just there's many things that go into that equation. Um, I have colleagues right now working in Japan work, who are working with the University of Melbourne on trying to promote that kind of framework globally. And when you look at the kind of things that count, a lot of the things that everyone was talking about are very important. You know, thinking about the green infrastructure, thinking about um, the spaces that people occupy, uh, think about the health infrastructure more widely. Um, and then you need to be considering um, the economic climate as well, and the, the the economy that you're putting forward, and and the um, and the competitiveness of the city then factors into that, right? So um, once you add all those things together, you start to get some of the way. But unfortunately, it's it's just very difficult to have that kind of prescription. So um, you know what you what you'd be looking for there is a an urban strategy that that deals with those gaps once you've done that framework analysis. Is is that kind of uh ranking and we now have a minister of happiness in the uae and there's all sorts of other uh jargon in some regards around that does a a, a a structure like that help in the context of your work g20 global smart cities having a destination using such ambitions as happiness does it integrate and and and, and make your work and the idea of uh, progress towards sustainable cities helpful is it uh, or a distraction? Well, let me tell you uh, where I think what I would like to see happen. A lot of the interventions that we talk about in the urban space and you know, a lot of the technology interventions, but also other, other types of interventions, they rely on returns on investment that are not financial. They rely on things that are more about how you're impacting citizens, how you're impacting the long-term health of the city, how you're impacting quality of life uh, over 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Those sorts of things are very difficult to put into a typical kind of financial process or, or, or business case process. And that's where I would like to see those sorts of frameworks and indicators uh, playing a role to start to quantify, you know, the, the value of, of those investments. Uh, I think at the moment, that's where I see some of that disconnect. And there are some, uh, you know, avenues uh, that might address that if you think about things like social impact bonds and whatnot. But until we get to see that, I think we're going, going to be missing a trick. And so I, I do think that there are some rankings that are less helpful and are a distraction. But I think that if we can figure out how to make that connection, they could actually be very powerful. Yvonne, Saudi Arabia, obviously, Riyadh, you're working on the Green Riyadh uh, project and uh, the rapid urbanization of the city. You described, I think, in the thousands in the 50s and now 7 million with a destination to 15 million. 68% uh, of the world's population due to live in cities by 2050. And uh, only a few years ago, that was closer to 50%. So massive urbanization. But my question to you is, where does your project, and obviously the, the, the city, we the, the Riyadh, uh, uh, the national, the capital of the country, but also a national roadmap for all Saudi cities uh, to become smart and sustainable, where does your project fit into that? Or are all of these standalone uh, strategies? Uh, well, the, the great thing about what's happening in Saudi Arabia right now is nothing is standalone. Everything is uh, governed under the 
the, the framework of the 2030 vision, which is an incredibly holistic plan for the country. And um, obviously it has a heavy focus on the existing uh, cities, but it also then is focusing on developing new cities and new urbanizations. So um, in some ways, you know, I, I see Saudi Arabia is it's investing and innovating on a scale that's unparalleled when it kind of comes to smart and sustainable cities. And uh, that that vision is quite complete across the board. So you see uh, the sustainability mandate is woven uh, into the core of every project. So whether we're looking at um, NEOM, which is, you know, setting the template for the city for the future, or you're looking at an existing city like Riyadh with it, with its Green Riyadh pro program, but that's not the only program it has. It's integrating its metro, it's integrating its sustainability uh, strategy, which uh, was announced last year um, just before COP26, and that sustainability strategy aims to place Riyadh as uh, one of the most uh, sustainable cities in the world uh, over the next come the next few years. And I uh, think what, what uh, would define that? I mean, th that's obviously a fairly big phrase, a big and um, the most sustainable city in the world for a desert city. Uh, tell us a little bit, stand that up a little bit. So, look, I mean, there's many ways in which uh, Riyadh can achieve that. OK, so firstly, if you look at uh, the program which I have worked on, Green Riyadh, uh, definitely that, that can set a template for uh, cities um, who are looking to adapt. So most cities right now um, are look they're facing serious issues around drought, heat stress, etc. I think it doesn't matter if you've generally been in a cooler climate. Most people are understanding what drought means right now. Um, and so Saudi Arabia has the most arid cities on the planet. And, you know, Riyadh is probably the largest of those. And um, if we can look to cool that city and adapt that city and um, develop a healthy, thriving ecosystem in the face of um, unprecedented climate changes, then that can set an example for other cities. Now, what's different about what Riyadh is doing, other than the scale of what it's doing, is the investment that sits alongside it. Um, I've been working with cities for many years, and I understand the budget cycles and the political cycles. And generally, what you what you have are nice, shiny plans and strategies, but they don't ever get implemented because they're not funded. And the thing that's different in Saudi Arabia right now is these projects are fully funded and they're fun funded over the longer term with decade and beyond long funding. So when you're looking at a situation like that, it's hard to see how um, they're not going to set the, set the standard for cities into the future. Rushi, the G20, you're uh, the lead, the G20 Global Smart Cities Alliance, We've we had uh, Saudi Arabia host the G20 presidency in 2020, in which it established the circular carbon economy as its signature project. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about where that has gone uh, in the context of the G20, which adopted uh, some of those uh, uh, roadmaps. Where the where the, the the sort of collective? How are they doing? Uh, has the G20, the global, the circular carbon economy, uh, my you know progressed in the interim years? And of course, you're only a few weeks away from the next G20 summit. Unfortunately, Sean, I can't really tell you much about that. It's not really within the scope of the G20 Global Smart Cities Alliance. Uh, our work primarily focuses on uh, the technology deployments that cities are using to actually achieve some of these goals. And you know, the work we did during Saudi's, uh, Saudi Arabia's presidency was uh, mainly focused on helping them to develop uh, mobility guidelines. So that's urban mobility guidelines that cater to uh, new use cases that come around for, um, you know, say you, you want to do mobility as a service or you need to deploy e-bikes or whatnot. Um, a lot of that requires sophisticated governance and policies which need to underpin that kind of future of mobility. And so uh, we spent quite a bit of time uh, with, with the uh, G20 
uh, working on that at, uh, during that year. And that kind of signifies the kind of work that we're, we're pushing towards. So I'd love to be able to help you on that, <laughs> on that topic in particular, but um, well, I can tell you that, uh, sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say that, that that's interesting, the point you make around mobility, because you'd have to say in a certain way, London and, and your previous role as leading the strategy team at the uh, UK's Institute for Smart Cities, the Future, Future Institute's catapult, that uh, that's something London seems to have got right. And my question to you in that regard is, uh, and I'll bring it Yvonne in uh, to that in, in a moment, because uh, she's coming from Melbourne with some very unique expertise, but bringing these experiences from, uh, uh, in your case, the UK, and now you're with the, the G20, but ultimately to uh, Saudi Arabia and your example there around mobility, how transferable are those and what can come back the other direction from a Riyadh? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I do think that there are lots of lessons learned from, from London on um, the importance of having uh, proper community engagement and good governance uh, and understanding the central role of, of the, the end customer or the citizen in whatever you're trying to build, and then trying to incorporate disruptive technology where you can, respecting the, the, the end customer as the ultimate interest. Um, and that, I think, was pretty much enshrined in, in the mobility guidelines that were put forward by Saudi Arabia. Um, I think that there's an opportunity here, you know, speaking about the level of ambition that Yvonne just outlined, to, to rethink some of that in terms of what could you do if you were planning for 30 years, you know, instead of five years? And, and you know, how do we prevent um, issues between, you know, governance structures from getting in the way of making progress? You know, I think London's politics can be particularly complex because you have, um, you know, you have the advantage of having a, a large transport authority with a lot of power but you also have the issues that come from having lots of smaller municipal municipalities We're on strike and, today. and <laughs> exactly and then you have a lot of uh, you have a, a diversity of transport providers as well that service some of that ecosystem which can cause complexity and so um there's uh, there's some opportunities there to try and get ahead of that by thinking about you know what is the kind of interoperability that you would want to build into the system from the beginning if you were starting from scratch on a, on a transport system, um, that would mean you're not so dependent on some of those legacy providers, that would mean that you're not so dependent on um, on, on intransigent political powers, you know, if, if, if you were trying to innovate for the long term. Yvonne, if you'd speak to that as well, and obviously, as I said, coming from Melbourne, bringing the expertise to Riyadh, but they, just on this issue of governance, we have in, in, you know, globally, of course, ESG, uh, uh, environment, social and governance uh, frameworks that are sort of di dictating many things now. And while in the region we may have alignment and understanding of E and maybe some S, but G is the one that still escapes a lot of the, op you know, the, the, the implementation in the region. So I'm wondering where that challenge is and where the experience that one could bring from outside, in your case, Melbourne into Riyadh. Um, okay, well, in Melbourne, I guess um, we we faced all of the challenges that uh, Rushi has so eloquently outlined there of, um, you know, many, uh, many different municipalities, stakeholders, many vested interests in um, trying to move forward on any small um, project. I actually spent a lot of my time working in the field of citizen participation there because no matter what you're doing, that's the only way to actually get something done that has some sort of longevity. So I think there's definitely um, uh, an, un, uh, an under-recognized opportunity in terms of working with citizens, whether you're looking at citizen engagement or digital democracy or whatever you want to call it. Um, in Melbourne, we designed and I led the, the Future Melbourne team to develop the Future Melbourne plan for the city. And that was entirely written by the citizens. So, you know, uh, thousands of citizens engaged online, sharing ideas for the future of their city and then those ideas deliberated on by a citizen's jury and uh, the plan then enshrined by the council and the council funding that plan um, and, and working to it. So uh, 
in some ways, um, when you look at, you know, the smart, sustainable cities and who's making progress, obviously Melbourne's one of them. Barcelona is another one. And and you find them using the very same mechan mechanisms, using uh, digital platforms to engage their citizens, trying to... Um, and of course, Riyadh their... and Saudi Arabia is a heavily digitally engaged population. What does this look like there? Is it part of the program? I, I, yes. Uh, so in terms of the, the 2030 vision, um, very much the mandate is to uh, push forward with uh, digital transformation for the country and to develop smart cities, smokes, focusing on the, the five largest cities first. Um, and I think we've yet to see what's what's going to emerge when when that gets married into the other the other projects. But when you're looking at Saudi Arabia, I guess the, the population is uh, young, mainly under the age of 35, 70% of them, and they're highly tech savvy. So um, there's going to be uh, this, I, I think this merger of, especially where we have like the cities that were retrofitting and transforming as opposed to the newer cities that are being created. I think we're probably going to see a flow of citizen uh, ideas coming into that. And certainly um, what I've seen from my time there is uh, the governor, the, 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 the policymakers are happy to listen. Rushi, if you could speak to that a little bit in terms of what you perceive are some of the challenges. Of course, G20 is quite a broad tent, even though they are the wealthiest economies in the world, but they're very different looking. I'm wondering from your experience in that uh, tent, what are the, some of the obvious challenges, hurdles that a Saudi Arabia might face that a, that a more, you know, let's say a UK or something isn't, and what are some of the things they could overcome those challenges? In this case, citizen engagement. I mean, there isn't democracy, there isn't representation in the way that we would, that you would have in the UK. Yeah, they do, exactly. The the expectations are uh, incredibly different in terms of how you need to make progress in each of these cities. And, and so a lot of the work that we do is in trying to advance policies which we think are, shall we say, maybe not universal, but are good models for everyone to learn from and are scalable across that such a big tent, as we put it. And so we do think that there are co enough commonalities to do that, but we find that the politics and the way that governance works means that the way you get these things through differs quite substantially. And so, you know, in a, in a place like uh, Toronto, for example, you know, and Toronto is one of our um, our, our member cities, uh, we take very seriously the, the the process of citizen engagement, and we 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 think that we need to be working closely through the digital infrastructure plan that was already developed in consultation with citizens there. Um, you know, and, and likewise, we would we would always assume that um, for many of these cities, you need to be looking at what is coming from that consultation process when you're thinking about um, what policies need to come next. In other cities, um, we find that working with senior leadership is very critical to make sure that there's enough buy-in for that that kind of process to begin with. And what I've also found from that is that I don't make assumptions about which of those two systems works better because sometimes uh, having a more forward-looking senior leadership that can see a problem coming down the line can be more helpful to us than having a very uh, sensitive uh, political class that is only working in the short term. And so if I give you an example, um, we know right now that um, cybersecurity threats are a serious, serious issue for local government. Um, it's hard to make the case for protection from cyber threats until there's a demonstration of the problem <laughs> if you're working in a short-termist uh, environment. And so, you know, in some ways, it's more helpful if you have a, uh, a system where, you know, a slightly more technocratic uh, layer can just make that decision and prioritize that over and above what might be a more kind of citizen focused or sorry, not citizen focused, but more, um, uh, should we say, something that's more appealing to a, a short term democratic vote. Um, so that's the kind of thing that um, I, I've seen in a, in a few contexts and, and sorry to be very general, but it's, you know, it's, it's a it's a well, I would imagine that with. resonates with you, Yvonne. Ultimately, I mean, our hometown of Galway, I know we were there over the summer in the west of Ireland. They're taking forever to decide on a green pathway and everybody has to have their say and it drags on for years. But in an environment like Saudi Arabia and Riyadh, 
you can be quite decisive about some decisions that need transformation. Um, well, well, I mean, Saudi Arabia has been very decisive um, about its own transformation. But I think in some ways, no matter how decisive you are, you still need your citizen support. And I think in in Saudi Arabia, from my work there, what I've seen is there's a, a very uh, keen attention to what do the public think? Are they happy with this? Is this going to benefit and improve their lives? And um, that that's kind of the core. I mean, often, you know, when you're talking about um you know small decisions that take a long time because they get deliberated on too much i i sometimes think it's a little bit around the the techniques that are used for those deliberations and maybe they get a little bit um you know, uh, the the right techniques are not applied to manage a situation, let's say, and ga gather all of the voices. You somehow sometimes have the same voices uh, shouting loudly that seem to represent the conversation, but don't really. Yvonne, just on the the when you think about some of the 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 change in uh, in Riyadh and, and the the green Riyadh, which of course is one uh, piece of a very large jigsaw puzzle. Of, of of tremendous change on so many levels in a country uh, over a short period of, period of time. Uh, does how does that co complement uh, challenge the the green part uh, when when there's just change everywhere? Is it is it helpful or how does it, how does it coexist? Do you mean being sustainable? I mean, change at uh, everywhere. You know, you could go to the restaurant now. Women can drive. They, you go to the movies. You can have a boxing match. I mean, there's just change on every scale in Saudi Arabia. And also, you're working on the biggest green urban project on the planet. I'm just saying, when you have such a big green project inside humongous social and economic change, I'm wondering how those coexist. Is it helpful? Is it a challenge? How does it, that part of it? Because that's pretty think, unique. Uh, yeah, it is unique. I think it's I think it's helpful to be honest because the attitude of um, the community is really one of excitement and looking forward to what's coming next. So you see, right now, you know, um, and many of those thing the the many of those projects are interwoven anyway. So the 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 key driver behind Green Riyadh is actually to create healthier citizens within a more livable city. And a livable city has many factors. It might have a lot of, you know, sports and recreation. So you have the parks to, you know, provide those spaces or that tapestry for those events to exist and for those events to be good as well. So you're creating a fabric which is functional for the city and then helps it project it to another level. But all of the other activities, the transformation in terms of uh, the social transformation and, and the physical transformation transformation of, of the city. In some ways, they're all kind of merging together. And I think if you zoom out of the city and you look across the country, in some ways, you know, every part, every corner of Saudi Arabia is undergoing the same process of change and development. And, and you, you know, you look to, to Red Sea, you know, trying to create uh, the most sustainably regenerative uh, urban tourism project on the planet and then you've got Neil and so in some ways with all of these things happening there's very much uh, let's say friendly competition between the projects to make sure and that kind of makes sure that the standards are elevated because one project sees uh, one project do another project doing renewable energy in a particular fashion then we want to make sure we're doing that too are we doing it well enough so I think you know the the benchmarks and the standards are all being raised by everything happening at the same time. It's uh, fostering a, an atmosphere of general excitement. And I think it's a great place to be right now for anyone who wants to work in the industry. Um, Saudi Arabia is a place to be and, and Riyadh is, is a, an amazing city. There's no doubt that a, a, a change of that scale is, is exciting. Uh, 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 Rishi, I'd like to just wrap up with the the, the sort of sense about that level of change. Of course, innovation is so critical in 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 everything about the future, the city of the future, work future, work of the future, and in the context of Saudi Arabia's great transformation. 
But building innovation is not ultimately an organic process. It's just if you could speak a little bit sort of in your closing comments to how important innovation is. And, and, and again, this sort of broad tent of G20, is there examples where developing an innovation culture has been successful and other areas where it hasn't? So we've been trying to tackle this problem pretty directly by trying to deal with the less flashy side of the equation. Um, you know, I think uh, what it's does easy that mean? To, Sorry, uh, to, uh, what is that? So, less so flashy? When, when I say less flashy, I think I, what I'm referring to is um, your backdrop's quite flashy. Would it be <laughs> less lights than that, or so? So what what we found, or certainly what I found in dealing with cities, is that um, most cities have an innovation kind of strand maybe a small budget, a small team, and they do small projects. You know, we're not talking about Saudi Arabia in this context where it's the opposite is the case. It's a, just a national level priority. Most cities have a small innovation strand going on, and then they have an enormous everyday budget, everyday operational structure that just carries on and carries on and carries on. And it's really difficult to get that innovation from that tiny bit to get that injected into the larger organization and let alone get that injected into the wider ecosystem and, and vice versa, you know, getting the innovation of the private sector and the kind of the tech sector and digital economy injected into those more traditional, you know, city operations, city services, public services, all those things. And so the which less are all very, bits, which are all very kind of public sector top down, if you like, uh, controlled. In the, in and, and exactly, and, and the, I think that um, the less flashy bit that I was getting to is is the procurement processes that sit in between. And so we've tried to think of that as the as the lever that we can we can pull to try and and deal with this issue, to try and get more innovation into those more traditional sectors. If we can demonstrate how procurement can be used as a strategic tool to drive the innovation that that we all want. Um, then we can start to, to move the dial. And that's, the, as I said, in Saudi, I think that's less of an issue compared to some of those other G20 countries that I, I described. But um, there's certainly precedent. You know, there's lots of cities that are doing experiments with, with using procurement as a tool for innovation rather than as a, as a, as a kind of excuse not to do it, <laughs> um, which it typically is used as. And so, so I, I hopefully... Um, you know, that'll make a difference. But that's that's only the approach we're taking. Yvonne, your closing remarks similarly to speak to innovation, because inevitably, uh, you know, as they say, necessity is the mother of innovation. You've got a huge, not only a commitment to change in Saudi, but in many ways, a necessity uh, for all of the reasons, economic, social uh, and otherwise. Uh, if you've got a country in the desert, you've got to make it more sustainable. Uh, where is innovation emerging out of your area, the green Riyadh, uh, and do you have any examples you could share? Um, well, certainly innovation for Green Riyadh has focused around the water. So where do you um, source the water to, to supply, you know, irrigation to over 7 million trees and 3,000 new parks? And here we're looking at um, developing a, a water treatment uh, and reuse network for the city and how that's styled and designed is is going to be uh, i think essentially something that will be the the core component of the project in a way it will be invisible in many ways because it will be underground but i don't think any other city has looked to fully treating and reusing its wastewater to support its own green infrastructure so uh, there we'll see innovation we'll also see it coming through um, the businesses that get support by this program. Uh, Green Riyadh is a, a multi-billion dollar uh, giga project. So in a way, it's going to uh, provide many opportunities for local businesses and entrepreneurs to develop new s solutions, whether they be in um, the type of composting you might use for soil in the desert or whether it's the type of trees that are being grown or how they're grown or the new techniques. And certainly um, there's going to be plenty of innovation there. And I 
think just, you know, on a larger scale, cities are generally the place where innovation happens. They're the meeting place for people to exchange ideas. And what I see happening in Saudi Arabia right now is you've got a lot of support for innovation and for um, particularly the younger generations to, you know, start up their own businesses for the entrepreneurs. And, um, you know, you've got organizations like Mansha At and you've got the MISC Foundation and they're very very much uh, pushing um, forward with supporting um, all types of entrepreneurs, whatever the idea is, if it can contribute to enhancing uh, the uh, life in the city or the economy, then they're generally getting supported. And I think when you have uh, an approach that's kind of open to the masses, that's where you get true innovation coming coming out because it's less filtered and more gets through. And uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see uh, what emerges from that process. Well, there's no doubt that in, in in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, in so many ways, it's, it's, it's a unique, nearly laboratory of transformation where you have a massive city like Riyadh in a transformation to green. And at the same token, down the road, you've got a city, a massive city, smart city being built from scratch. How can those two, I mean, there's probably no other country in the world where that coexisting experiments are taking place and the learnings and the innovations that can hopefully cross pollinate in both directions will be useful and allow us to continue talking on this podcast for many months to come because there clearly is a big journey. Thank you both for being on the Sustainability Dialogues in Saudi Arabia, where today we were talking about governance and policies to develop smart and sustainable cities in Saudi Arabia. Big thanks to Yvonne Lynch, urban greening and climate resilience strategist at the Royal Commission for Riyadh City. I'm sure we are going to be having Yvonne back if she will be with us again. And Rushi Rama, lead G20 Global Smart Cities Alliance at the World Economic Forum. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Rushi, for being with us. And we look forward to both of you joining us again. But that's it for this edition of Sustainability Dialogues in Saudi Arabia.